The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have, you do, have, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. He is here. Okay. We'll just wait. People, are they done? No. Nope. How, how long has it been since the gospel? 30 seconds. 60 seconds. Twenty-seven seconds. Twenty-eight. Twenty-nine. Thirty. Alright, we are going to dive into it. So welcome to the part of the service where we reflect on the word of God. And we learn what it means to apply to our own lives. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about expectation. Expectation. Because what is the general, uh, there's a saying in our Western tradition, right? Expect, where did it go? Uh-oh, wrong one. If you lower your expectations, you'll never be disappointed. So lower your expectation for your husband, right? So he'll never disappoint you. Lower your expectation while you're dating so that, you can actually get married soon. Lower your expectation for that vacation you might take, because who knows what the weather's going to be like. Lower your expectation for anything. Because why be disappointed? Would you not rather be surprised when things work out than expect and then be let down when they don't? It's like we're afraid of disappointment, isn't it? 
So do we bring that same mentality to our churches? Do we say, and I've heard some people say this, oh, God has bigger things to deal with than with me. What is that? I don't expect him to do something in my life. So do we have that mentality in church? Do we not expect God to show up or do something in our church? Let me talk to you about our gospel this morning. It was a, an ordinary Sabbath in Capernaum many thousand years ago. And on this ordinary Sabbath, people just say, i got to go to the synagogue, because that's what you do on the Sabbath. You go to the synagogue. Some people came with a weary week, the burdens of the past week, but they came. Some people came with concerns. Some people came with a bit of frustration for no other reason. Maybe, maybe, I'm just making this up. Maybe they didn't have uh, cream cheese on their bagel this morning. And so they're just a little ticked off that that's a plain bagel. You know? Maybe some people came with their, trying to wrangle their kids, saying, this is, this is the Sabbath, come on. And the kids are just screaming, saying, I don't want to do this. And so they're a bit frazzled. But they all came. They all come to synagogue from various paths emerging from various experiences of the week gone by with different emotions. They came. But on this particular morning, Jesus of Nazareth is their guest speaker. Now, isn't that cool? You might think, oh, that must have been fascinating for them to have Jesus to come. It was an ordinary Sunday morning. And honestly, any Jewish male could get up in the synagogue and explain the Torah. But because it was Jesus that came, and it was because it was Jesus that spoke, every single person who came on this ordinary morning to Sabbath left that day thinking and feeling that they have truly been in the presence of God. Something has happened. And they left in amazement. And from that moment on, as, as our passage read, reads, right, and Jesus became famous. And from that moment on, everyone knew that when Jesus was there, they could expect more than just a normal worship service. Let me ask you this question, though. Oh, my. Why were the people astonished? Why were they astonished? Anyone? Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, true. Yes, that's exactly it. They weren't astonished because they're like, oh, he cast out a demon. This is cool. Here's what they say. What is this new teaching? What is this new teaching? And one with authority. What is this new teaching? One with authority. My goodness. Give me a second. Would you mind closing that second door for me? It's okay if she cries. It's okay if she cries. It's breaking my heart that I can hear her cry. That's why I'm asking to do that. Not because I'm like, oh, be quiet. I got to do something. No, no. I feel terrible because she's asking for Upaya, which is me. Uh, so that's why I'm asking to close the door. Uh, all right, so they're astonished because they say, what is this new teaching? One with authority. And that's interesting because they're not saying, let me shift gears here, right? Authority is very, it's a very unique thing in a synagogue. Whenever a rabbi would come and speak in the synagogue, right, they would, they would say, my authority comes from the rabbi that taught me. And his authority came from the rabbi that taught him. And his authority came from the rabbi that taught the other person, and so on and so on, all the way back to Moses. And so their authority came from Moses. Right? But Jesus had a different kind of authority. And so to really understand this, you have to, we have to go back to the brilliant Deuteronomy passage of our Old Testament today. 
you know, I often don't say, oh, I love how the lectionary has laid everything out. But today, I love how the lectionary has laid everything out. The Deuteronomy passage, Moses says this, there's going to be a prophet who's going to come after me, who's going to be greater than I am. Moses was the greatest prophet to have ever lived in the history of Israel. He was the greatest prophet because he spoke to God face to face. God spoke to him. He revealed who he was to Moses. So who can be greater than Moses? Anyone? Anyone? God himself. Yeah. God himself. There's going to be somebody who comes after me who's greater than who I am. God himself. And when he speaks, you better listen. That was Deuteronomy. Well, when? And that's what Mark is alluding to. This authority of Jesus. When he speaks, we better listen. Because when he speaks, the demons listen. What does he tell the demons, colloquially speaking? What does he tell them? Shut up and get out. That was what he said. Shut up and get out. And it listened. The authority of the words of God are his actions. Let me put it this way. We humans, uh, our words have to be Oh, what is someone trying to say? Backed up. Our words have to be backed up by our deeds. So if I were to walk into this church and say, let there be light, will it happen? If anybody says yes, you have a very high thought of me, the answer is no. I will have to go and have to flick on that light. My words have to be followed by a deed that I do in order for my words to be fulfilled. So sometimes my words might not be fulfilled. For example, if I say, let there be light, turn on the light, but there's no power, my words are not fulfilled. But when God speaks, his words always result in action. When God says, let there be light, light shines. When God tells Lazarus, get out, he doesn't have to go inside the tomb and do CPR, Lazarus gets up. When God says, pick up your mat and walk, he doesn't have to go and like do some magic on this guy's leg and massage it out. No. He gets up and he walks. When God says your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus says to the demon, get out, it gets out without question. The words of God are his action as well. As one, um, as Timothy Keller says, by God's very nature, God acts through speaking. When God says something, reality changes. Every Sunday, every one of us come to church with the weariness of the week before. We might come frazzled because of something that happened this morning or something that happened this week. We might come with a busy schedule saying, oh my goodness, I just can't wait to get over with this so I can go to the next thing because I have so, much th so many things on my plate. I'm a busy person. But we're here. And thank God we're here. As every Christian knows, as every one of you here know, Jesus is present on a Sunday morning worship service in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every Sunday, we have Jesus with us. And we have even a tangible, a tangible symbol of Jesus with us every Sunday, the Eucharist. Every Sunday, we taste and see as the Lord is good. Jesus is here. Now, if you come every Sunday expecting a good sermon, you might not find it. And I know there have been many weeks where you have left disappointed. I wish Noel had said that better. If you come every Sunday expecting good fellowship, or great fellowship, and your friends aren't here, you're going to leave disappointed. But my gosh, Jesus promises, and the Word of God promises, if you come expecting an encounter with Jesus, it will happen. Let me get a little nerdy here. Okay, uh, do you see that chair, that red chair, that big honking thing over there? Anyone know what that is? 
Okay, Sylvia, you're nodding. What is it? All right, when the bishop isn't here, what is it? Oh. <laughs> when the bishop isn't here, it's the, it's the Christ chair. It's a theological nerdiness, but I won't get into that aspect of it. Right? That chair, empty, reminds us that every single Sunday, we reserve a spot for Jesus here. And every single Sunday, he fills it. But any time in the, in the New Testament, when Jesus goes into a worship place, a synagogue, is he over there singing hymns and just kind of hanging out with the people? Never. Any time you find Jesus in a synagogue, he's speaking. He's doing something. And something profound always happens whenever he's in a worship space. In the same way, in our worship service, because Jesus is present, he's not just hanging out and waiting for me to finish my sermon. He is speaking. God is speaking through the words of the liturgy. The liturgy is nothing but passages of the Bible put in a way to order us to worship. He's speaking words in the liturgy. He's speaking to us in the words of Scripture that is read every Sunday. He's speaking to us in the sermon. He's speaking to us in the Eucharistic prayers. He's speaking to us in the blessings. He is constantly speaking. Do we come with an expectant heart to hear him? We come with our problems and our issues, our frazzlements and our joy, but do we come with expectation? Or are we too afraid to expect, because who knows, what if we're let down? You see, God wants to speak into your anxieties. Do not be anxious, but in all things, in prayer and thanksgiving, present your request to God. God is speaking to you. In, if you're looking for healing, by his stripes you are healed. If you're saying, God, I'm stuck in a rut and I need something new, the word of God says, see, I'm making all things new. If you are looking for God to speak, he's saying, I am here in that still small voice. God is speaking to each and every one of us every single Sunday. And the only way you can hear it is if you're expecting to hear it. If you don't expect God to be present, you're going to have a closed heart, closed eyes, and a deaf ear. That's what the Bible even says. Right? They have ears. They do not hear. They have eyes. They do not see. Because they don't expect it. But God is here and he is speaking to you. In what way is he casting out something that is unclean in our lives? In what way is he creating something new in your life? In what way is he answering your prayers, the deepest desires of your heart? You got to hear it. You gotta expect it. Now, kind of my sermon, but there are the times when it feels like I'm here, I'm expecting, I'm not hearing God. God, like, what are you trying to tell me? I don't hear it. There's an ancient church practice that's called coming to God with an intention. Anyone know this? 2,000 years I've been doing this, right? So here's what I want you to do beginning today and hopefully, hopefully for the rest of your lives, right? When you come to the altar rail for communion and you're receiving Christ, this beautiful image, as we offer ourselves as living sacrifice, Christ gives us, to him, gives us himself as an offering. So different sermon, different day, right? You come to the altar rail and you receive the sacrament. Come with an intention, with a prayer, with a question, with a thought, with a need, with an intentionality as you approach God and present your request before God. And then, take that two seconds, and then eat, and then drink. God will respond. 
not immediately, but make your request known to God and he will hear. And do that at the, at the place, at the moment where you are going to meet him in the sacrament. Where you will taste and see that the Lord is good. That the Lord is good. Come with an intention. Today, for the rest of your life, with a little prayer. Okay, that's kind of basically my sermon. But here's the season we're in is we're the season of Epiphany. Right? The season of Epiphany is who is God? What is he being revealed as? Oh my goodness, I'm having an epiphany, right? What is Mark trying to tell us? This is God. This is God, and he has the authority to speak and create and do something in your life. And then that has to leave us with this demand on our lives. If God is speaking to you, and if God is making something new, and if it is in fact God, then he also says, follow me. This is Mark chapter 1, the beginning of the Gospels. You want to know more about who this Jesus is? You want to have more of the authority that he claims to have? And in fact, later on, this authority becomes our authority, different sermon, right? If you want this Jesus in your life, who's going to make all things new, follow him and see where he leads you. That's my sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who makes all things new. You are a God who... Speaks, speaks into our lives, speaks into our anxieties, speaks into our, into our sadness, our joy, and our hope. Or as we present our request to you, open our ears to hear what you have to say, and open our eyes to see where you move. This we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Questions, comments, thoughts before we keep going? Don, were you going to say something? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I like what you said about the bishop's chair, about it being uh, Jesus being there. But there was something in the Old Testament that you weren't here for. But it was kind of scary. It said, "If you speak, uh, if the if the prophet speaks something, God didn't want him to speak, he will die." Oh like, yeah. Does that? Do you ever think about that? All the time. <laughs> all the time. Uh, I think about that. <laughs> I think about that all the time. In fact, in Timothy, uh, it says, "You you have been called to a specific task." And if you, you are at a place where you can change, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? A place of influence. And if you say the things that God does not want you to say, then you have a higher punishment than others. I think about that quite a lot. Because if I, if I make things up, or if I am trying to please people in what I'm trying to say, then God's like, you're not a person that I've called to do this. Your role is to reflect God in what you say and what you do, not try to please people. And so, I, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's scary for me to come and speak because if, if I'm leading people astray, what is the Bible passage? Better a millstone tied around my neck, right? Um, yeah, I'm very careful. And that's why sometimes I might come back and I'll apologize for something I said wrong. <laughs> right, right. I'm not going to be zapped, yeah. Okay, uh, here, death in, in biblical terms, I'm going to say this, death in biblical terms, it's not like, ugh, I'm gone, right? Uh, it's a separation from God. 
right? And so we can be, even on this earth, separated from God. And so there is that, if you want to take a metaphorical death, you, God, in a sense, says, I'm going to take my spirit away from you. In Isaiah, it says, and I've taken my spirit away from him because he was doing exactly what I did not want him to do for a long time. Yet at the same time, after the spirit is taken away, God says, but I looked at this man who I've taken the spirit away, and he was slowly diminishing, and my heart broke. And so I drew close to him so that he may live again. It's never a, ah, you've done it, you've goofed up, too bad, peace, right? It's, it's, it's always a, hey, there's always a chance for repentance. Come back, and if you repent, I will forgive and I will draw close to you. And that's also, that's also there in the Old Testament. It's not just like a New Testament thing. Um, God, what is it? Um, morning prayer, opening sentence. Morning prayer, opening sentence. Anyone, anyone, anyone? Ah, oh, anyway. There is a prayer. God always listens to those with a contrite heart, and he will draw near to them. Seek him while he wills to be found. Call upon him when he draws near, and he will answer your prayers. There it is. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, would you all please stand as you're able for the Apostles' Creed? Let us confess the faith of our baptism as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again.